Okay, so we're on Gimel of the Base 13b. We don't have much time, but let's learn something. Okay, so now we get to Moshe Rabbeinu's funeral itself. Moshe Rabbeinu's funeral, his death and his funeral, uh, which is a reward measure for measure for his taking care of Yosef's funeral, which we described at length. So says the Gemara. Moshe Rabbeinu tells the people. Where is this pasuk? This pasuk is in, of course, in the bottom, towards the end of the And Moshe tells the people, I today am 120 years old. So the word today didn't have to be there. He doesn't have to say the word today. He could have just said, I'm 120. I'm 120 years old today. Today, I complete the totality of my days. This is the day my birthday. His birthday and his passing is the same day, the seventh of other. And this is a unique feature for Tzadikim. The Lamda Chad teaches you that God completes the years of the Tzadik from day to day, from month to month. Just to say there's a certain level, a certain a uh, special element in someone who passes away on his birthday and that his years are complete in their entirety. The Ksiv as the verse reads, es misbar um, This is a verse in Shemois. Es misbar yamachamale, the, year, the days of your years, or the number of your, of your years or days I will fill. So to say your days are full from day to day, month to month. So this is Moshe Rabbeinu's statement before he passes away, that his life is complete, he's exactly 120 years old on that very day, passing away on his birthday, the 7th of the month of other. Didn't your father say in his children that Aaron was the only one that was married before today or not? Or he's the only one that's married? Uh, so Aaron is the only one in which the scripture itself tells us the day he um, passed away. But Moshe Rabbein was not, doesn't state in the Torah the date, but we figured it out based on the dating of other things we know when Moshe Rabbeinu passed away. We discussed this a bit before. Three months from when Moshe Rabbeinu um, gives the Torah, before that is his birthday, and we figured out exactly. Right, so the, the, the calculation is done elsewhere, but um, what my father was referring to is scripture itself stating the date of death, and that's only for Aaron. Yeah. The Gemara continues. The verse reads, the verse continues, I am today 120 years old, and Moshe Bina continues, I can no longer come and go. So says the Gemara, my lot is for loving. What does this mean that Moshe Rabbeinu cannot come and go? What does he mean I can't come and go? So if you're going to suggest, lot is for loving, mamish, literally come and go. He's too weak to walk around. He's 120 years old, right? He can be weak. So you, perhaps that's what it means. It says the Gemara, this cannot be the case. It cannot mean, Moshe Rabbeinu cannot mean that he no longer can come and go physically. Because Bahaksiv, we have a verse which reads, it's a few chapters later from the verse we're quoting earlier. Exactly. First of all, the verse says, Moshe Rabbeinu was 120 years old, the Moshe at the time of his death. And the verse reads, Loi nos lecha. He did not lose any of his juice, didn't lose any of his strength. The Ksiv in the verse reads also, Vayal Moshe Ma'aris Moab El Har Navoy, that Moshe Rabbeinu went from the plains of Moab to the Mount of Navoy. He climbed that up. Vitanya, we learned, Shteim Asri Mailus, Hayasham, there were 12 steps on this mountain. Uposan Moshe Bepsia Achas, and he jumped all these 12 steps in one step. I'd love to see what the significance, the spiritual significance of all this is. The connection between him being born and died on the same day, and the connection of 12 steps specifically, and 12 step and one step, what this means spiritually. But the Gemara means that on the basic level, the simple level, which is what the Gemara is addressing, is Moshe Rabbeinu was a full strength at 120 and able to climb 12 steps in one step. And therefore, the Gemara says, So what does it mean when Moshe says, I can no longer come and go? So, Amr Rabbi Shmuel Nachmani, Rabbi Shmuel, son of Nachmani, says, Amr Rabbi Yenison, the name of Rabbi Yenison. Lot says for love I the divide tida. 
that Moshe Rabbeinu, at this point, is telling the people, I no longer can come and go in the Torah, in the Torah study. I no longer have that ability to, to, to banter back and forth in the Torah. I don't see a commentary here from Rashi, but it would seem to me that the reason is because now it's time to have to hand over the baton to Yeshua. So I can no longer come and go, meaning Moshe is saying, I've reached the line in terms of the Torah and guidance I can give you. Now it's time for the next leader. That's seemingly what the Gemara means. So Melamed teaches us, the gateways of wisdom have been closed to him. Right? And this is reflected in, um, what was it, yesterday's Chumash? Where you have this idea, yes, in Chumash, in Rashi, this week's Parsha, where the verse changes the language between Vayidaber Vayomer to say that while God was upset at the Jewish people after the um, debacle with the spies, the prophecy to Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't the same. And Rashi comments because the prophecy that leaders get is only an account of the people. And perhaps therefore, now that the baton is being passed to Yeshua, the gates of wisdom are closed to him at now. Because he no longer, his, his whole capacity for wisdom, his whole capacity for that level of understanding is because of the people. Now he's no longer the people. The leader of the people, he no longer has the passageway to that wisdom. Now, if we're going to be honest, I would wish to have the closed passageway of, wis of wisdom that Moshe Rabbeinu had. <laughs> Meaning, even when we say that Moshe Rabbeinu's passageway to wisdom is closed, it does not mean, God forbid, that he forgot his Torah, or that he lost all of his le levels, or that he doesn't have the genius. It means that whatever... Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu had in terms of being able to access divine wisdom on that level to be able to communicate and draw down Torah to the people, that no longer is in Moshe Rabbeinu's hands and now passed on to Yeshua. The verse doesn't say, the Gemara doesn't say passed on to Yeshua. I'm suggesting that the reason why it's close to Moshe is because now it's passed on to Yeshua. That seems to be the implication. I think Gemara is about to comment on, on the transition. As the Gemara comments, because the next verse reads, by Yelach Moshe, and Moshe went, right? Is it the next verse? It's a few verses later. Let me make sure I'm getting it. Yeah. It's a few verses later. The verse reads, by Yelach Moshe, Yeshua, Moshe and Yeshua went, and they both stood in the house, the tent of the meetings, that is to say, the Mishka. They're both there to communicate to God. So says the Gemara, Oyster Shabbos, that Shabbos, that day is a day of, I lost my place, Duzugai Paisa, the day of like uh, two pairs. In other words, there were two leaders on that day, the beginning of the day, Moshe Rabbeinu, and the rest of the day, Yeshua. Because Nitla Roshush Mizeh, permission was taken from this one, and Nitla Lazen, give it to this one. Yeah. Yeah. This is the day when Moshe passes over to Yeshua. So this is what I think. That's why I think it means that the day the wisdom was closed. Because the more that goes on to say it, this is when he passed on the batons. So that's why I'm suggesting that when the Gemara says that he no longer has that gateway to wisdom, it's because he's now to hand it to Yeshua. Because whatever level it is, this level of chachma, divine wisdom, divine, which we learn in Hasidus actually that chachma actually is beyond wisdom, beyond knowledge, beyond intellect. Wisdom is the capacity in the mind to reach that which is beyond, which is why transcend, transcend which is usually, which is why Chachma is associated with a spark of genius. Because where does the spark of genius come from? The thought that pops into your mind. Where does it come from? Yeah, we know it comes from, sorry? Idea. The idea, where does it come from? We know it comes from somewhere because it came into our head. So we obviously know there's a part of our minds yeah, yeah. that we're not accessing, that we're not accessing consciously, but that's giving us information. So it's not, it's, so it's, so it's not, so it's not intellect itself. It's the source of intellect. That's what Chachma is. Insight is wisdom. It's the, it's, it's the meeting point between that which transcends consciousness and consciousness. Is that like first burst of an idea where you know it came from somewhere in your mind, but you don't know exactly what that part of your brain is. Exactly. So Chach, that's why Chachma is the highest level. That's why Chachma is the beginning. All holiness is Chachma. 
the, the, the verse says, death, but not in Chachma, because Chachma is attachment to God itself, because it's like that, it's the openness to be willing for insight. And the divine connection, meaning it's this openness, this surrender to say, whatever you want that God gives me. And that's really what's required to transmit Torah, not just be an intellectually smart guy and be able to communicate Torah. Moshe Ben certainly retained that even after he passed on the Batanti Yeshua. Why? He's, now all of a sudden Moshe Ben is no longer intelligent, God forbid. But this capacity to be the Chachma, to be the conduit between divine wisdom, divine desire, divine will to the people, that become, gets passed on to Yeshua just before Moshe Ben passes away. But is there any negative uh, reference there? Because you mentioned Zugoi in pairs usually in other areas where we study the yeah, doing things in pairs is negative, something. Uh, yeah, yeah, the word, yeah, it doesn't mean, I don't know what that means. Have, does it really Look, mean? there were times in Jewish history, there was famous five generations of Jews that were, uh, five generation of leaders that were pairs. They were called the Zugas, the pairs. Oh, that, five that, generations, Shema and Atalia, Shema and Hillel, they were pairs of leaders. Zugas just means pre pairs, yeah. Just means a set, set, a set of two. So this is the day of set of two. And that two people are, uh, the, the baton is handed from Moshe to Yeshua. Right. I just remembered a talk that everyone said on the eighth of other. Seventh of other is the day Moshe being passed away. The eighth of other. And never talked about the eighth of other being the first time that Jews had a full day without Moshe being. And that they learn how to mature up and serve Hashem on their own without Moshe being. It's true they had Yeshua, they no longer had Moshe being. The first day alone without a Moshe, this is the first day of Jewish people's maturity, right? in the sense that they're no longer being spoon fed by, by Moshe. Well, that's what happened with the golden calf. They, they thought they didn't have any. This is what happened with the transition. This is the transition Jews always go through throughout history. Yeah. Maybe it was even the very capable of winning the Jews in the right now. Because first of all, they didn't know. And second of all, they literally took a great part of. Yeah. So it, work away from them, you know? the, I mean, in terms of his physical strength, the Gemara just told us that he was in full strength, even at 120. Um, and it seems like he clearly wanted to continue serving. But God said it. What you want, you want to, yeah. to do. To, yeah. yeah. And a part of this is also the fact that his generation died in the desert. And there's different Midrashic implication as whether this is God's desire or Moshe's desire. But it was by design that Moshe would have to stay with his people in the desert. Your people are dead in the desert. You don't get to go off and walk off into redemption when your people are in the desert. Stay with your people. We don't have to be the last ones. That's right. The, the, the captain of the ship is the last one to leave. Okay. So if his people are in the desert, he's got to stay in the desert. So there's a lot going on here in terms of Moshe being, uh, being compelled slash wanting to continue to lead the people, but at the same time wanting to stay in the desert with his own people. And this is the transition that's going on here in Moshe being his passing. We didn't have that are right now. Several grievances between people and people. I did that, yeah. 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 I'll add also that. Lost it a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. I'll add also that this idea of Moshe being uh, uh, close, the case of Chachma being close to him, this idea that he's no longer the one who's going to be the transmitter of divine wisdom, this level of transcendence that is communicated into, into language. That is comprehensible, right? Like the, like the idea popping into your head, it comes from the subconscious and then pops into the conscious. So like this, this chachma, this ability to be able to just take divine inspiration and communicate it, that's passed on to Moshe Rabbeinu. The verse refers to it as coming and going. Lots of for love. Coming and going. Right? And that's because on you know, a simple level, Moshe Rabbeinu has to come and go. He's got to come to the divine and leave the divine to give it to the people, right? But this is also the, the, the tension it describes a true connection to Hashem in this level of chachm, this level of, of wisdom, this level of surrender to be able to be open to Hashem's insight. On one element, the person has to, let's say, leave. He wants to leave this material reality so that he can just escape and consume himself in the divine. But it's also got to be lovely. He's got to come back. What does the divine want from you? The divine wants me to be here and serve him. So there's a tension between coming and going that the Jews constantly straddling in his relationship with Hashem. In the language of I said this borrowed from the verse elsewhere, Ratzay Veshov, the running and the going back. Right? Or the language of the Mishnah, right? The Mishnah says that a person is born against his will and a person dies against his will. 
So a simple way of reading the Mishnah is it's two different times. Before a person is born, you'd rather not be born, and he's forced to be born. Before a person dies, a person would rather be alive, and he's forced to die. That's the simple way of reading the Mishnah. But Hasidus learns the Mishnah that these two desires, or the two forcings, the Jews are forced to be alive, and the first, against his will he's alive, and against his will he's dead, is not at the beginning and end of his life, but actually continuously that both of these things exist. That simultaneously a Jew says, I don't want to be living in this body. A, go a godly soul needs to be dragged into the bathroom. And the bathroom would be the better thing to be dragged a godly soul into. But that's not a sin. It's just dirty. Right? And metaphorically, there's a bunch of bathrooms we drag our godly soul into. So what the godly soul wants is. But simultaneously, the godly soul also says, I can't leave the body. Where else am I going to do mitzvahs if I don't have a body? Right? That's the ultimate chachmas, the ultimate surrender to Hashem, the ultimate openness to being Tashem is, on the one hand, I want to live, give up everything just to be with you. But then I think to myself, what do you want, God? You want me to come back here and serve him? Okay, i got to serve you. And that's lots of the lovely. The coming and the going. And then as Moshe Rabbeinu passes away, it's not that he no longer has the wisdom and no longer has the connection to Hashem. He has the connection to Hashem, but he doesn't have that coming and going anymore. Because the coming and going is only in a body when you're serving Hashem in the body. Where the soul wants to leave, but it's forced to come back. And now that's over. So it's not that he doesn't have the, all the wisdom he had before. And it's not that he doesn't have the connection to Hashem that he didn't have before. We're going to learn soon that the Gemara comments that even after Moshe's death, he continues to serve Hashem and continues to serve the people. Now he does so from heaven, but he continues to serve. So what's, what, what's stopping? What's changing now? What's changing now is the coming and the going. Now his service to Hashem is in like a, it's more in equilibrium. In the body, there's a tension. The soul wants to leave the body, but he's got to stay in the body to serve. There's a lot of love. There's a coming and a going, as the verse says it. And now Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm coming to the end of my life. I'm no more coming and going anymore. Now I'm going to a place of serene attachment to Hashem. I continue to serve, but not in this tension that the soul deals with when the soul is in the body. The lots of love. They're coming and they're going. Yeah. And that's the ultimate shadi the ultimate service, the ultimate surrender to Hashem is the capacity to live with this tension. What happens in, in the case of a non-believer? All his life, he didn't live in life, didn't want to have anything to do with shuls and study and everything else. The soul is like lost. Yeah. So he, the shuls should be happy when the guy dies. So, thank God I'm going look, back up to, to heavenly things. I, I don't like being God's lawyer. No. I'd rather be Jewish people's lawyer. So, <laughs> as a Jewish people's lawyer, I'm going to say this person had a mission that you and I don't know. Whatever mission Hashem had for him, he certainly fulfilled. Whether he's outwardly in the way, whether, whether we thought of him as an atheist, not an atheist, what we. What we we don't know what was inside of his heart of hearts. We have no idea what he was dealing with, what he was feeling, what he was thinking. And as far as we're concerned, a Jew dies it's because he fulfilled his mission to, as mandated by Hashem. Whether he actually did, it's Hashem's business. And if Hashem is going to ask us, did this guy fulfill his mission? Our answer is absolutely yes. Why? Because he was born and died. That's how we know he finished fulfilled his mission. So our, our job is not to be God's lawyers. Right. We're, we're the Jewish people's lawyers. That's our job. Yeah. And this we learn from Moshe Rabbein. Even though he chastised the people because it's his job as leader, he still turns to Hashem and defends the people. The same, very same people he chastised. But does that mean that we're not allowed to judge Hashem? Judge Hashem? Why do we judge Hashem? Well, because that's what it sounds like. We're not, we just trust that everything he does is... We trust everything he does and we know that he empowers us to demand of him. Where is Moshiach? We say it how many times in our prayer? Yes, yeah, so we can. Still, we're still allowed to ask. And, and push and, and demand push. and ask. Yeah even as we accept his judgment. And be upset with him. It's a, upset is a strange word. I don't know if I would use that word exactly, right. but certainly um, express it. our desire and express our feelings towards Hashem is yes. And there are certainly Jews who are quote unquote upset with Hashem. People specifically who have numbers on their arm. And I have no, uh, their being upset with Hashem is probably a deeper connection to Hashem than all of my supposed love for Hashem, I would think. It's my, uh, my opinion. But in terms of how like you and I have to behave, we don't just get a pass to be upset with Hashem. We accept Hashem's judgment. But we also accept that Hashem empowers us to demand, where is Mashiach? Why, why are you suffering? That's what an end already. That's the only area we have no choice. Is what of what? You have to, you have to, you have to let Hashem do what, what you have to accept. you're programmed for. You have to accept at the same time. We're not, uh, we're not, we're not satisfied. Even as we accept, we're not satisfied. This is your will, yes, but we're not satisfied. We want more. We want Mashiach. We want revelation. Your we want to see you. Your father said something to me one time. And I still remember it. I'll never forget it. When my daughter passed away, months later, I said, I'm so angry at Hashem. 
he looks at me and says, Hashem is probably smiling. What do you mean he's smiling? I'm so angry at him. Why is he smiling? He says, because you you accept that there is a heavenly source. Yeah, this is true. It's a very, very deep, very, very deep idea. Never yeah. forget that. It's a very deep idea. Yeah, I think this is expressed in Moshe in his death. And I'm saying that I no longer could come and go. I no longer have that tension. Everything now from now on, he has his clarity. He's connected to Hashem. He sees everything. But to be a conduit of serving Hashem, to be to be Chachma, requires the lots of love. It requires the tension that a Jew, that you struggles with. It's this is the same tension. Everything Hashem does is good, and that's it. But the same hand, on the other hand, what do you mean? I want Mashiach now. It's the same tension as the body, as the, the soul saying, I'm not interested in this whole body business. Let me just go back to you, God. But at the same time, what do you mean? I have to do what Hashem wants. I have to stay in the body and do what Hashem wants, do mitzvahs. It's, so it's the tension of coming and going. That's right. When Mashiach yeah, comes, we're going to long for the day because, right. because true life is tension. That's right. Because true life is tension. My uncle says that in the last Sabbath, there are no fights. That's in the last Sabbath, there are no fights. In the last Sabbath is the funeral. It's the cemetery. Uh, no fights in the cemetery. Right. Life is tension. That's what living is. Living is tension. It's tension between the beautiful and the ugly, between, between acceptance and demand, between I want to give up everything and I have to serve you all the way. This is the tension that you live. This is the lots of lovely coming and going. That's what makes the real like electricity. Electricity is not stagnant. It only operates because it's moving. Because there's a current of constantly running back to the battery and then running out of the battery and running back to the battery and then out of the battery. And that's the tension of life, the coming and the going, the moving, the pumping, the blood pumps physically. Pump in, out, in, out, breathe, exhale, inhale. Life is the tension, the coming and going. So life is spiritually, physically. Sorry? We're in a rush to get out of that state when we regret it. And it's no longer it's, it doesn't seem we'll regret it. It says we'll look back at it. Yeah, it doesn't seem we'll regret it. Yeah. Will we have regrets? When Mashiach comes? Yeah. I hope not. Right. I hope not. I don't want to have regrets. Why would I want to live with regrets? No, to say that, that oh, well, all the mitzvahs that we could have done, or all the things we could have done. So yeah, we're going to look, that, it's not, I don't know, regret, but we'll look idea. back at it and say, like, I guess it's a regret. We should have used it. We should use the opportunity more. Yeah. Done this. yeah. Right. We didn't take advantage. Yeah. yeah. Now it's too late. Yeah. It's just, yeah. <laughs> took it long enough. Yeah. No. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Mashiach's going to come either way, and the question is only going to be: Are we part of it or not part of it? Right. That's the question: Are we part of it or not part of it? Yeah. Then the line, the line goes. Siddim would say that what's the difference between someone who learns to this or, or not is aha. Meaning, we learn to this now, and we learn about levels of godliness. To say we fully understand these levels of godliness, not convinced that we fully understand what these things are. Even if we understand it intellectually, but we don't really know what we're talking about because we're talking about spiritual, lofty, godly ideas, and we're human right. beings. But when Mashiach comes, we're going to see. What the spirituality is, and we're gonna say, ah, that's what we we're talking about. <laughs> right. So we're able to say, aha, that's the whole time we're trying to understand that this is what it is. Got it? Okay. It's like someone who never saw a copy machine in his life. People explain it to him. So it's an idea. You put a paper here, and this whole machine makes another paper come out. But then one day the guy sees it. Ah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. And you get the benefit of that. You it's the revelation. That's right. You understand and appreciate it much better because you have all that background. Now you see it. You have a whole different appreciation. And that's kind of what we're doing when we learn learning this, right? And same too with the with all the base of mikdash. You know, that's the, right. Learning about the base of mikdash. That's right. The, it's like you show up yeah. and you're you're familiar. You're not a foreigner in this in this <laughs> temple. You arrive and there's cat, animals coming and going. There's rooms and there's structures and there's things. And like, what's going on here? But if you learned about the if you learned about the base of mikdash, you know it's flying. You know, right. you know you're not you're not like a blood and cups and pouring and this. It's like yeah, don't be surprised. This is what's going on. This is what we do. <laughs> don't be so shocked. That's right. <laughs> yeah. About this. <laughs> yeah we sh- you know, we're going into Tisha B'Av, Shabbos, for Tisha B'Av, the Shabbos Chazai, and this is the Shabbos of Mashiach, and may it indeed be so. We don't have to have a, we don't have to have a Tisha B'Av. No one's going to complain if you don't have a Tisha B'Av. Now, the, the story goes that the, uh, that someone like complained to the Chachamim that the Tisha B'Av is too harsh. The, the sages and the sages said, We only expect it to happen for a couple of years. We didn't expect this to last for two and a half thousand years. Take it up with uh, the guy who's keeping it, still, keeping Tisha still around. So that, that, that's such a dish Shabbos should bring complete transformation. 
This is how the story goes. I don't know if there's any source of the story or where the story comes from, but this is how the story goes. Making the point that this wasn't supposed to be a two and a half thousand year deal. Yeah. May you merit with that without delay and to all suffering. Okay, we have Shabbos. What's the Chazan mean? Chazan means vision. Oh, okay. So it comes from the Haftarah. The Haftarah this week begins with the word Chazan. There's a, there's a vision it's described in the prophets. But it's been taken by Chazidim to understand that the uh, Levi Yitzhak Bardichev describes this, the famous Hasidic master, contemporary of the Altarada, who says that every year on this Shabbos, each Jewish soul is given a vision of Mashiach's coming. Mm. as a foretaste of what we're going to this Shabbos. This Shabbos. So, so that the, the name Chazan has gone from just being a description of the Haftarah to a description of what every Jewish soul is experiencing on Shabbos, being granted this vision of Mashiach's coming. Vision, yeah. Okay, good enough Shabbos. When is that supposed to happen? <laughs> Happens over Shabbos. The question is if we're in tune to it. If we're in tune to it. The question is if we're in tune to it, it's something else. Uh, we will not be upset if you come. No, like, like the Rebbe used to say there, that. Uh, that uh, that they, they always want talk. They always want talking about Mashiach coming on Friday. So someone asked the Rebbe, "Why are you saying Mashiach is coming on Friday?" The Gemara says that Mashiach is not going to come on Friday, not to disturb Jews. So the Rebbe said, "Not to worry. When Mashiach comes, it says he's going to answer all kinds of questions. He'll answer this question too, but we'll be okay if he comes on Friday. Disturb our Friday and stuff. Our, our Friday preparations. Don't worry about it. Come, and when you arrive, you'll answer the question about how you came on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. For, forgive it." So it doesn't, we don't have to wait till any due dates. You can come and that's it. Yeah, okay. He walks in on Shabbos. We'll be very happy. Okay, have a good young, have a good enough Shabbos. Evening.